also proudly that I have three wives. I've raised between them 25 children, and between those children we now have 16 grandchildren. 17. I did the count, it's 17. <laughs> uh, that was with Maddie's. Yeah, to the north. So. There is a false narrative that the nuclear family is the typical family, and that's not really <laughs> true. People seem to think that Leave it to Beaver was a documentary. It wasn't. You know you have a very wonderful father, don't you? Oh, sure, Mom. Oh, sure, it was an idealized representation of what people aspired to. And since that time, the nuclear family has been held to be the ideal and all other families have been held up against it. Families like ours weren't supposed to speak up. And if you did speak up, you could either be put in jail or there was more often the prejudice you would experience. One of the false narratives that goes around about plural families is that there's no choice and that everybody that's in them are either a victim or a perpetrator. And the lack of understanding that's gone on about plural families has really caused that narrative to grow. And, you know, different legal systems have kept people quiet and afraid to come forward and say, that's not us, that's not who we are. All right, it's ready. Let's have blessing. Okay, go ahead and say it. It is a love story for me. We've all come from plural families. And, you know, I just graduated from high school. I really was focused on school. I wasn't looking to fall in love. I knew Joe, he was friends with my brother, and then Vicki is my cousin, and I have hundreds of cousins. So I think I saw Vicki and Val twice when we were kids. When we got older, Vicki and I became friends. As the relationship of the two of them blossomed, they decided they're gonna come out after me together. And that was very confronting for me. It was a surprise to all of us. But we were just like, let's kind of see where this goes. We're just open to yeah. the lifestyle, so might as well yeah, look into it. Yeah, because we both believed in it, and so we were like, why not look at it and see how it can go. We were married for 10 years, and then this gal come, shows up. I came along. She had come out of a divorce and was coming over, and I saw her like for the first time for me, and we were both really confronted. I wasn't looking for another wife, and... Um, I felt a zing, and then I was like, what was that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Shortly, she joined the family along with five kids, and we became a plural Brady Bunch family. The crime has traditionally been if you purport to be married. So it was a law against language, rather. So we couldn't even talk about it. You didn't say anything about your family. You didn't want to lie, but then you felt this pressure, like, I can't own who I am. I can't say who I am. And I think when you do that to a culture, you do that to people where they're not even able to speak who they are or be proud of who you are, it really marginalizes and then leads for that culture to be exploited. I'm writing a book now in which I try to look at ways in which people who consider themselves family have to contend with a system that tends to give greater validity to mainstream families. And I'm interested in the idea that this nuclear family really was an invention of the 20th century. They originate from a 1950s idea that there was such a thing as an ideal family. And they originate a lot from the idea of normality. And it began in mathematics. And in mathematics, it meant the thing that occurs most frequently. Check, no mistake. That idea of normality was very much celebrated. People wanted to fit in. They wanted to be the same. Eccentricity was devalued. Originality was devalued. And while the pressure on human beings was significant, it was nothing compared to the pressure that was placed on families. Oh, he was Tommy's father, home from work. And here comes mother to say hello. Every week, father comes home with money for Tommy and for mother. Families had a way they were supposed to look. 
and there were roles. There was a breadwinner father, there was a caretaker mother, there were a couple of children, maybe three, there was a dog, there was a cat. It was idealized in media representation, and the assumption was that in these households, free of disability, free of difference, free of so many of the things in which we have since come to find meaning, that it was in those households that people would have the best, the optimal, the most wonderful experience. So we came to a very sentimental and a very narrow notion of what it meant to be a family. Marriage to three women, isn't, isn't that illegal? You have never seen any family like the Dargers. Love Times Three, our true story of a polygamous marriage. We have the Dargers here. Uh, guys. The Dargers were willing to come out as polygamists at a time when almost nobody did. They said, the representations that are out there of us are wrong. There are people who are suffering in polygamous marriages. There are people who find them joyful. Those stories need to be heard. Only the stories of people who have been miserable are being heard right now. What really got us all inspired to become more public and try to change the narrative was my daughter, Kira. Um, she died when she was five months old. the investigation and the way that we were treated and the fears that we had of interacting with other agencies, it was really, really painful. They went in and they pulled out all the kids from the same last name in the schools around to interview them. You know, I was only 30 at the time and I just didn't know what to do. And we had seen some other families where there were some cases where the, the people had had something happen to their child and were, you know, were being accused of some kind of abuse. Yeah. And they chose to kind of go deeper and hide and, you know, the fear just made them go, we don't dare talk to anybody, we hardly even dare go out of the house and we could see, yeah. that's not going to be healthy. And we didn't we can't want do to that. do that. I mean, I wanted to do that because I was really scared. But Joe was really angry and all of us were kind of wondering what to do, but we just knew it couldn't stay the same. It just couldn't stay the same. Joe, do you constantly smile? Huh? I mean, we realized that narrative that we talked about is so strong that if we didn't start doing more interviews or being public or talking about it, even though it was a risk to talk about, if we didn't do that, it was not ever going to change. We really tried to examine what we had to do to change the law. We did a lot of politicking and we got a lot of people active in politics. Uh, I want to thank Joe. Uh, We had to really focus on the Republican Party to get any kind of influence and get people to see that we had a voice. When these crimes do happen in plural families, they are often not reported because of the widespread fear of the media and law enforcement. Joe has had a number of insights that were crucial to bringing about decriminalization in Utah. In the first place, he said, we have tried for many years the freedom of religion argument, and it has never worked. He said the freedom of religion argument does not, in fact, cause people to open up and say that they want to accept those of us who are practicing polygamy. It was defeated by the Supreme Court in the Reynolds decision in the late 19th century. It has been defeated in courts over and over again. He said polygamy is a free speech issue. He said nobody gets in trouble because he has slept with a bunch of different women and had children by them. He said, I have children with three women and I call them my wives. And it's because I use the word wives that our lives are stigmatized. He said, that is a free speech issue. I should be able to call them whatever I want to call them. And so it was the revelation, I think, that this could be negotiated as a free speech issue that was his great primary insight and the beginning of the shift toward decriminalization. A lot of people know there's no way you're ever going to change the law in a Mormon legislature. And we had that unanimously passed in the Senate, overwhelmingly passed in the House. Polygamy is not legalized, to be clear, but it's decriminalized. We got it to go from criminal, felonious, to now it's an infraction yeah, in 18 yeah. years. So you take in Krista and Tori and... Krista and Tori to Jenny's and then Tess either wherever we take her. <laughs>
a lot of times the fact that it was criminalized was used as a license to then discriminate. Yeah. Well, it's not religious discrimination because you're illegal. So I can deny you housing. I can deny you a job. I can deny you a loan because you're involved in a felonious lifestyle. So now that we've been able to alter that just this year, we're hoping that more people can come forward and own who they are, and then we can put an end to this kind of narrative that continues to exist from keeping people quiet. If we just hold on to the nuclear family versus being more accepting, then we continue to ignore what is in society. What is is single parents, polygamous families, it's gay families, it's polyamorous families. So if we're going to continue to ignore what is, then what we'll continue to do is then resist it, which then turns into hating it, which then turns into more strife. However somebody wants to organize themselves to create the future, we need to accept that because that is America and that is who we can be for the world.